Okay, welcome everyone. My name's Debbie Rolfe. Um, I've been asked to come to speak to you today for two hours um, with regards to GCP. Um, there is an exercise that I've put on your desk so at the point where eyelids are normally quite heavy. You will be asked to stop and have a look at the, the bits of paper that I've put on your desk. But I'd like to obviously take this opportunity to thank the sponsors for allowing me to come and talk to you for a couple of hours. So it's all about clinical trials, course and workshop. Has it been good so far? You enjoyed it? Does everyone understand when I'm speaking, do I speak too fast or do I need to shout, speak up? Okay, sorry. I'll point the microphone. If I speak too fast, give me the slow down sign, <laughs> please. Okay. So, I'll crack on. What is GCP? So good clinical practice is an international ethical scientific quality standard for designing, conducting, recording, reporting trials that involve the participation of human subjects. Now this GCP is aimed primarily, really, at clinical trials that involved drug studies. So just in case it's going to shock anyone because they don't think that they should be here. So throughout this presentation, there will be numeric references directly lifted from the GCP guidance. So I have literally lifted the text from the GCP guidelines. But I will briefly explain the structure of the guidelines in a moment. So the objectives of GCP was to provide a unified standard for the US, the European Union, Japan, and now it's across the world. It's to facilitate the mutual acceptance of clinical data by the regulatory authorities in all of these jurisdictions. So in essence, data can be trusted within one country and can be transferred to another, so that trials do not have to be repeated and the risk exposure of extra participants to any risk that that trial may have carried. And obviously it also saves pharma and um, the industry money. There are 13 principles of GCP all listed here, and we are going to touch on each one of those as we go through the presentation. Now, since the initial publication of the ICH GCP guidelines, the size, complexity, and the cost of clinical trials has massively increased. In addition, advances in technology has made it easier to handle far larger amounts of data, and improvements in risk management have allowed for far more effective oversight of studies. Because of these changes, the ICH brought out a revised set of guidance called the E6 Revision 2, which is what I'm going to talk to you um, today about. The final version of this guidance was published in November of last year. The majority of the update incorporated into the modernised ICH GCP guidelines is in the red highlighted areas 10 and 13. So the responsibilities throughout ICH GCP are split three ways. There are three key stakeholders. You've got the research ethics committees or the institutional review boards, the investigator and the sponsor. Now the chapters there listed are those of the chapters within the ICH that actually list those responsibilities. And the, the little pop-up that just rolled up the screen, those are in the way that it's split up is that chapter one is the glossary. So the glossary definitions are what are referenced, the 1.27, 1.34, 1 1.53. Chapter two covers the actual principle. Chapter three is the rec responsibilities. Four, the investigator responsibilities. Five, the sponsor responsibilities. Chapter six covers the protocol and what a good protocol should contain. Chapter seven covers the investigator brochure and what that should consist of. And chapter eight lists the minimum essential documents that you should um, hold in your trial master file. So what is a clinical trial? So a definition. 
It's any investigation in human subjects intended to discover or verify the clinical, pharmacological and or pharmacodynamic effects of an investigational product and or to identify any adverse reactions to that drug and or to study the absorption, distribution, metabolism and excretion of the drug with the object of ascertaining its safety and efficacy. So principle one. Clinical trials should be conducted in accordance with the ethical principles that have their origin in the Declaration of Helsinki that are consistent with GCP in the applicable regulatory requirements. Now, in um, perhaps an email that you would have received prior to this course, I sent it with some links. So you had links directly to the Declaration of Helsinki and some other helpful documents because two hours, if you tell a sponsor that you've learned all about GCP in two hours, their eyebrows will hit the roof. So you will need to look at those documents at your leisure. But a little bit of history. So following the atrocities that revealed by the World War II, the 1947 Nuremberg Code had ten principles which was first tied into the Declaration of Geneva in 1948 which was a statement of physicians' ethical duties. The declaration specifically addressed clinical research reflecting changes in medical practice from the term human experimentation used in the Nuremberg Code. The Nuremberg Code stated that consent was absolutely essential. Now doctors were being asked uh, permission. They're actually asking permission. Were at all possible, and research was only allowed without consent where a proxy was available. So principle two, before a trial is initiated, foreseeable risks and inconvenience should be weighed against an anticipated benefit for the individual trial subject and society. A trial should be initiated and continued only if the anticipated benefits justify the risks. For principle three, it's the right, safety and well-being of the trial subjects are the most important considerations and should prevail over interests of science and society. A good historical example of where this was clearly not a consideration was the experimentation revealed from Unit 731 in Japan, run by the Imperial Japanese Army during the Second Sino-Japanese War between 1937 and 1945. Unfortunately, instead of being tried for war crimes, researchers involved were provided immunity in exchange for their data. The United States utilised it in their biological warfare programme. Does anybody know anything about that unit? It's pretty horrific. Look it up. Vivisection without anaesthesia, removal of organs while patients were alive in order to preserve the organs amputations to study blood loss, reattachment of limbs to different sites of the body. Some prisoners had limbs frozen to study the effect of frostbite. They were centrifuged to death, starved to death, as in how long would it take? Biological warfare, such as the development of symptoms and spread of bubonic plague, cholera, smallpox, botulism, following direct inoculation and what the most efficient methods were. There was weaponry and bomb studies where bombs were detonated at various distances away from the unfortunate victims to facilitate determining the most effective and destructive way to cause harm. Principle four. The available non-clinical and clinical information on an investigational product should be adequate to support the proposed clinical trial. You are not permitted to commence your chosen phase or clinical stage of research without sufficient background evidence or knowledge to support moving into that phase. And this is where the lovely investigator brochure comes in. It's a compilation of clinical and non-clinical data on the drug that is relevant to the study of the product in human subjects. It should be reviewed and updated annually. And if you do come to review your investigator brochure and there is no updates to any of the information in there, you need to stipulate that in a file note and then place it in the trial master file so that you've got evidence that you've actually reviewed the information within it. The PI 
The principal investigator should ensure that all the study team members are updated and familiar with the new information and record that on the training log in the trial master file. You must also ensure that any of the participating sites receive the updated information, especially any participating pharmacy departments. Principle 5. <coughs> Clinical trials should be scientifically sound and described in a clear, detailed protocol. So we have the protocol. It's a document that describes the objectives, design, methodology, statistical considerations, and the organization of a trial. So this is your procedure of how you're going to conduct your study. The protocol usually also gives the background and the rationale for the trial, but these could be provided in other protocol reference documents, which you would reference within your protocol. The contents of the protocol, as alluded to earlier, are suggested in Chapter 6. So I would suggest that you would check with your institution for any of those that would like to carry out academic studies and see whether or not they've got an institutional protocol template just because the text that needs to stay in there, such as um, safety reporting and insurance and indemnity, shouldn't really change from trial to trial. Um, the main text as to how you're going to keep within the guidelines. So just check with them. There is um, a really good document that perhaps you could read, and it's the Spirit Guidelines. So that was guidelines, I think it was published in 2013, and it's standard protocol items, recommendations for interventional trials. And it's an international initiative aims to improve the quality of clinical trial protocols by defining an evidence-based set of items to address in a protocol. So principle six, a trial should be conducted in compliance with the protocol that has received prior institutional review board approval or favourable opinion. The review board setups may be different depending on the country that the study is being conducted. In the UK, there's only one research ethics committee for national approval, and then you seek local R&D research and development approvals within your hospitals. I understand that in Italy, that there are reps at local and regional levels. It's the same in Ireland. So principle seven, the medical care given to and medical decisions made on behalf of subjects should always be the responsibility of a qualified physician or, where appropriate, of a qualified dentist. So which is yet another principle that's embedded to assure the safety of subjects and their appropriate selection and inclusion and their continued care. Principle eight is each individual in conducting a trial should be qualified by education, training and experience to perform his or her respective tasks. So at St George's, um, we're quite lucky because it's a university which sits in the same footprint as a hospital. So we do see really good collaborations between our academic professors and their clinical colleagues that can actually look after the patients. So these are um, additions that the Revision 2 brought in with regards to the investigator responsibilities. So the supervision of any individual party to whom they have delegated trial-related duties and functions at site. Now, from my understanding, it is that it's always been the case that an investigator, by providing a signed-off delegation um, log, that he's saying that his research nurse is um, sufficiently trained, perhaps, to complete the case report form for him or to provide other support, that he would actually sign that off but now it's actually written into the revision too. So nobody has any doubts anymore. We have to ensure that this individual party is qualified to perform those trial-related duties and functions and implement procedures to ensure that the integrity of the trial-related duties and functions performed and any data generated. So no longer can he just say, well, it was the nurse's fault. It is his fault if he's not kept an eye on her or him to make sure that they're actually doing the job properly. 
They have to maintain adequate and accurate source documents and trial records that include all pertinent observations on each of the site's trial subjects. The source data should be attributable, legible, contemporaneous, original, accurate and complete. Changes to source data should be traceable, should not obscure the original entry and should be explained if necessary, e.g. via an audit trial. So who is this person, the study investigator? So a chief investigator is the person designated as taking overall responsibility within the team of researchers for the design, conduct and reporting of a study. Whereas the principal investigator is the person at each site responsible for the day-to-day running of the research project. So for a multi-site study, you're going to have the chief investigator that is overall responsible for the training selection of the principal investigators that he's nominated at each site. So the role of the institutional review boards, who are they? They should have at least five members with at least one non-scientific member and at least one member independent of a trial site or institution. And they can be clinicians, nurses, pharmacists and lay people. It is continuous ethical approval at intervals appropriate to the degree of risk to human subjects. So you would expect an annual progress report to be submitted to the Research Ethics Committee so that you can update them with anything that's gone on with the study. The REP Committee will have a document checklist and a protocol to critique, review and assess to ensure that the project is sound. They will also look at the peer review to ensure that the hypothesis has been supported. They'll be looking at the CVs to ensure that the team members are suitably qualified. Any risks that you've put in your application form and in the protocol, they need to have been identified and mitigated, and it needs to be described within the protocol. The patient information sheet needs to be looked at to ensure that the patients are fully aware of the potential risks and benefits. So a copy of the drug monograph or the investigator brochure, which may detail previously reported adverse events, serious adverse events, and any reported drug reactions and their frequency and or severity. So they're going to cross-check the safety information that you provide to them and make sure that the patient is going to be made fully aware of what they're signing up to. Also, the consent form and the patient information sheet will ensure that the patients are consenting appropriately and that no inducements are being used to entice patients to participate. Principle 9, that freely given informed consent should be obtained from every subject prior to any clinical trial participation, and that's prior to anything trial-related being conducted um, on that participant. So even any screening procedures, you need their consent before you start. So we'll go through um, the informed consent process. It's a process by which a participant voluntarily confirms his or her willingness to participate in a particular trial after having been informed of all of the aspects of the trial that are relevant to the participant's decision to participate. Informed consent is documented by means of a written, signed and dated consent form. They've normally got boxes on them. Don't allow the consent form to be ticked. They need to initial that because anybody can tick. They need to be given time to ask any questions that the participant information sheet may have raised. And they also need to know, if they're not going to be going into that study, what's the alternative care that can be provided to them, which is sometimes why it may not be appropriate for a nurse to provide consent for a a CTIMP study. Also, you have to consider, if the patient was withdrawn from the study... So what's going to happen with their data up to the point of withdrawal? You need to make that quite clear to the patient. If you are going to be anonymizing samples and or data throughout the study, they need to be aware that there may be information that's already been collected from them or about them that can't be retrieved. They need to be able to sign up so that they're happy for that to happen. And also underline the fact that it's their right that they can actually refuse and they can pull out whenever they feel like it and it's not going to affect their future care. A 
A copy needs to be provided to the patient. They would get the copy. The original needs to be um, kept in the medical records. And you need to keep a copy in the, um, your site file or the trial master file. It is a continuous process throughout the study. So if any of the safety information or anything changes that the patient had signed up to, they need to, to be asked again whether or not they would like to continue in the study, having been provided with the updated information, and they need to sign a renewed consent form, and that also needs to be documented in the notes, the medical notes, that is. So requirements for valid consent. It should be the chief investigator or the principal investigator or a suitably qualified individual. It must ensure that there is sufficient opportunity to read and consider the information, and it is preferred that it's longer than 24 hours, unless you are beyond doubt, and so is the patient, that they do not require longer and that they would not change their mind should they have been provided longer. And normally that type of time period would have had to have been declared, bless you, to the ethics, um, the review board, and they would have had to have approved that. It must um, ensure to reflect on the implications of the participation. So it's okay getting that patient in, but if you need them to come in 10 times over a monthly period and they need to turn up at 6 o'clock in the morning on those 10 times, they need to know what they're signing up to to make sure that they're fully aware because otherwise you're wasting your time. They need to be able to ask questions and discuss with their family or their GP they need to have capacity to be able to understand the information and be able to process what you're actually asking of them. So give due consideration of their age, maturity and their cognitive ability. If you have a, a case where it's the participant or the potential participant is illiterate, think about a thumbprint. It has been done in African studies. It can be witnessed, so you would need to have the name and the date of the witness entered by that witness and signed. So adults without capacity, you've got the mental illness, mental disability and or brain damage. There are country specific regulations and it's normally that you'll have a hierarchy of what the preferred um, person instead of the potential participant would be. And the first person would be their legal representative, and that would be suitable by virtue of a relationship, and they need to be willing to be able to place their, their relative into the study. And the other would be a professional legal representative who is not connected with the study, so fully independent of your team. They should be the person that's primarily responsible for the person's medical care, or they should be the one that's nominated by the relevant healthcare provider. The informed consent of vulnerable subjects to participate in a clinical trial may be attained by the legal representative and must be the presumed expression of the will of the subject, provided that the subject has received information adequate to his or her capacity of com comprehension. Furthermore, it may still be withdrawn at any time. So for unconscious patients, research should relate directly to the life-threatening condition of a subject. You can have a legal representative, personal or professional, to give consent. A waiver would be accepted if it's allowed by the review board, so that would have had to have been described and approved by the review board. For emergency research, the patient should be reconsented. So in the case that you get a patient that comes into the A&E department, then they may not have a family member there, so you would have got your legal um, representative. When the family member turns up, you need to ask and check that they're happy for that participant to be included in the research and document that. And then when the patient actually wakes up, you need to also ask them for their consent. At any time, consent can be withdrawn. So no longer can a surgeon consent a patient to research on the way down to theatre. Who should obtain consent can be a tricky situation. Basically, whoever is taking consent and discussing the study with a participant should know the study inside out, be able to answer any questions on it, and be able to offer alternatives. 
They should be able to have a discussion on the risks versus the benefit, and generally it should be a clinician. Dependent relationships should also be noted, because most patients will do whatever their doctors tell them to. So good clinical practice says the investigator should take consent, but the Declaration of Helsinki says qualified. So it will be dependent on the type of research and any of your own institutional policies which may remove the dilemma and dictate who's allowed to consent. The assent of minors, children, any research that directly relates to the child's clinical condition should be conducted. A parent's signature is sufficient in law and best practice would be that you actually get the child's assent to them being included, if deemed competent. However, assent is not legally binding, but it is favoured by ethics committees. The child should be involved as much as possible, so you should have patient information sheets that are age-related, so you tend to get more and more pictures um, in those information sheets and diagrams just to, so that it would actually help them understand what's going to happen. Parental consent should reflect the wishes of the child, which may actually overrule the parent's wishes. I did look to see um, how the Italian um, legislation paired on this, and it does not generally allow research on children, either as healthy volunteers or as patients, unless there is a reasonable expectation of direct benefit, i.e. it's got to be a vaccine study, and it is always with the consent of both parents. Now, there is something that we have to consider in today's society, that children may not have both parents around. So in the case that you have a mum and dad that live apart, you should really try your hardest to seek the consent of both parents or do not include that child. It would save quite a... A hefty court case if you had one parent saying that they wanted the child in there and the other parent taking you to court because they did not want that child included. So just don't put the child in. So some inspection findings. Missing consent forms. So it's not actually possible to verify that the subjects have been consented. Lack of subject or investigator signature to demonstrate a mutual agreement to participate or even that the investigator was there. An unapproved consent form used. Consent forms used referencing the wrong patient information sheet. Consent taken by persons that are not listed on the delegation log, so therefore there's no evidence of training to obtain consent. So remember to keep your approved document list up to date so that you keep track of what consent forms and patient information sheets have been approved. If you spot a document that requires an amendment, don't amend it without getting approval for the Research Ethics Committee and for your institution. Keep your team training logs up to date. Just keep checking them. When you have your regular team meetings, Have your delegation log out there so that any end dates can be added as people leave the team and any new members can be added after they've been suitably trained. And also, think ahead to scenarios where team members may not be available, annual leave, sickness. So don't keep your team too small because it can be quite restrictive because you might miss patients. So we've explored fully informing our participants and gaining their full informed consent. So please can you look at the example patient information sheet and consent form that I handed out and have a look and see whether or not you can spot any problems with them.
Would you like some more time? You ready? Okay. Right, does anybody want to start with the consent form? But high level. Give me some high-level stuff that you would expect on one of your consent forms. So high-level, I would say there's no, it's not dated, it's not versioned. So forget about the, the text, there's, there's, no, there's no date, there's no version on it. They've been asked to tick boxes, and they should be initialed. There's no evidence that anyone else could sign it bar the patient. So you haven't got a a mutual agreement in place there. So where it's talking about the patient information sheet um, version and date, that's funny because this particular one hasn't got a version and date. So what have they been provided Do not like the wording of number two at all. And number three, what's the the biggest thing that leaps out? Yeah, completely. Especially with the data protection regulation that's coming out. We'd get shot, fined, and... So what about number four? We wouldn't expect that either, to be honest. (laughs) We wouldn't expect that either. Number five. So, the patient information sheet. Anything leap out? Anything leap out? 
apart from the spelling errors, bad, in, bad um, English. Yeah. And they're not allowed to withdraw. Yeah, they can't withdraw. Yeah, otherwise you're going to ruin everything for us. Yeah. Otherwise the whole study will be seriously jeopardized. <laughs> so the other thing with regards to the information sheet, they've got to give it back. So they're not going to keep a copy. So where's the evidence? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And these people that they've they've actually gone in, they've looked at their medical records without their permission to identify them but do they actually know that I mean we don't know that they're actually I suppose um, knowledgeable about their condition so seeing the words liver cirrhosis when they might not even have been told would be quite alarming Yep, and they're going to have them on the treadmill for an hour and just send them home afterwards, and these are seriously ill people. (laughs) (laughs) If you don't feel well, just go and talk to your GP. Yep. Yeah, but who is this guy? Because that's the other thing. They, they keep dotting about with all these different people that these people have never met. They have to go to the conference committee of the hospital and not Yeah. It's not. <laughs> Where was the other one? The research they, may be published. They do not know what the physician are going to look, which is the aim of the And that, and that individual participants will be identified unless their case is particularly significant. So, yeah, mm. awful. But do you like it? <laughs> so we don't want to see any consent forms like that, and it's not a real one. Obviously, it was a joke one. <laughs> it is, isn't it? And genocillimab. <laughs> Right, so you're awake now then. So principle 10. All clinical trial information should be recorded, handled and stored in a way that allows its accurate reporting, interpretation and verification. Now it's the bit that we all love. The essential documents. And it is a little bit like that as well. So if I do fall into the trap, of dropping in acronyms, please stop me. Common ones that you will hear will be the PSF, which is your pharmacy site file, TMF, which is your trial master file, and the ISF, which is the investigate site file. We have to be careful, some teams may further split down the ISF into working files. So 
I've seen what happens because I've been out there auditing and monitoring. So just be careful that the documents are always the right versions wherever you're keeping them. So always have a, a pull together of wherever your files are and just have a cross-check. Just do it regularly. Or every time that you've had to put an amendment in, just pull all your files in and just make sure that all of the superseded documents are actually removed or marked as superseded in your trial master file and dated so that we know the date that they were actually removed from circulation. So what are these essential documents in Chapter 8? So essential documents are those which are individually and collectively permit the evaluation of the conduct of a trial and the quality of the data produced. These documents serve to demonstrate the compliance of the investigator, sponsor and monitor with the standards of good clinical practice and with all applicable regulatory requirements. Filing essential documents in a timely manner greatly assists in the successful management of a trial by the investigator, sponsor and monitor and normally it will be these documents that are inspected by the regulatory authorities as part of the process to confirm the validity of a trial conduct and integrity of the data collected. The biggest problem that I have seen, and I am guilty myself, is the printing off and filing of emails. So if you've got an email where, because of, I suppose, the world that we live in, we don't get letters anymore, which would have been nice and easy, and you can find the right section in your master files and file it in there. With an email, it's, you've answered it, it's gone, you filed it. If the inspectors come in, unless you actually want to sit them in front of your inbox, then I suggest that you try and get yourself, I have to do it myself, into the habit of printing off any of the essential emails, and that's any emails that may contain decisions where sort of something has actually changed or somebody's approved something within a study. Print that off and file it. So why bother? It's the first things that the inspectors, the auditors and the monitors look at. They will ask to see your files. It organises the paperwork. It saves time, effort and it facilitates the conduct of the study. It is, and it hopefully it does, prevent the incorrect documents being used or accessed by any of the team members. And what if a safety management communication wasn't in the file? So you could actually put patients at risk and one of your team members in a pretty sticky situation. So the trial master file, the TMF, as we lovingly call it, they should be established at the beginning of the trial both at the investigator site and at the sponsor office. So the sponsor should have a mirror file. So every now and then, the TMF at the site should be pulled back by the sponsor or the sponsor should go into the site and actually make sure that they mirror each other. The essential documents are generally grouped into three stages of trial where they're generated. And in Chapter 8, you've actually got lists of the document name and where... Theoretically, they're supposed to have been generated. And that list in Chapter 8, although it's extensive, as I said before, it's the minimum. So whatever, however, whatever would be required to reconstruct that study, stick it in the file. Description and purpose of each document and where, whether they're kept at the sponsor office or the investigator site or both, again, is contained in Chapter 8. And all of those documents that are described should be available for audit by the sponsor's monitor when they pop into site and inspection by the regulatory authorities. So there are some revision two changes to the essential documents. The, essential, the sponsor and the investigator must, main record, must maintain a record sorry, of the location of the documents, including the source documents. So wherever your file index indicates that something should live there and it does not, it's kept somewhere else, put a file note in there saying where it's kept. And make sure that if you say it's kept somewhere, that it is kept somewhere. So, for example, if you, if you run um, quite a number of studies, you may not have the CVs and the GCP in your training records kept in each of your study files, 
you may have them in a central location. So for each of your individual trial files, put a file note in there and say that they're kept in the training file in Mrs. Smith's office. The storage system used during the trial and for the archiving, irrespective of the type of media, you should provide for document identification, version, history, search and retrieval. So because the inspectors are actually seeing more and more electronic files, they would expect your electronic storage system to be just as searchable as if they were provided with a pile of um, physical files. So just bear that in mind and go back and rearrange your e-files. The essential document should be supplemented or maybe reduced where justified before the study is initiated. So if you're not going to keep something, write down that decision, put it into a file note, and make sure that the chief investigator has signed it off with the sponsor. The sponsor should ensure that the investigator has control of and continuous access to the CRF data reported to the sponsor. So that is a change. So the data that is provided in the CRF stays with the investigator. No longer does it go off and it becomes the sponsor's. So you must always, as investigators, maintain access to that. Don't let the sponsors run off with it. Where copies are used to replace an original, the copy must fulfill the requirements of a certified copy. So there's a new definition in the glossary for a certified copy. The investigator should have control of all essential documents and records that are generated by the investigator before, during and after the trial. So principle 11, confidentiality of records that could identify subjects should be protected, respecting the privacy and confidential rules in accordance with the applicable regulatory requirements. So in May 2018, the European Data Protection Regulation is going to be implemented. And here's a little bit of um, history of it. It was created to regulate the progression of personal data within the European Union and is part of the EU Privacy and Human Rights Law. You've got the number of it there, and it was signed off on the 27th of April 2016. And at the bottom of the screen is a link, and I do believe that I sent you the link in the email as well. So I would suggest that you have a look at that um, regulation with future in mind, because the biggest message that I'm hearing regarding this regulation, which looks to be enforced in May 2018, is there that there is a presumed opt-out, which means that you as a researcher will require explicit consent from any participant to utilise or access their data. So I'd go back and start looking at your patient information sheets and your consent forms, both your research and your general practice ones, to see whether or not there's something that you could perhaps amend to future-proof so that if you want to do some um, addition or collection of data of all of your patients of a particular disease type, you're actually going to have to contact them in the future to be allowed to access that unless you do something about it now. The investigator site file. The participant ID log must never be in the trial master file or the sponsor site file. So the sponsor shouldn't have access to directly identifying information in their files. Any lists such as screening logs must be identified and anonymised before they're shared. The participant should be assigned with unique trial identification numbers. Case report forms, they're still noted as property of the sponsor, that the source data should not be a replica of the CRF. The CRF can only be a source document if the data is solely for trial purposes and not for routine clinical practice, for example, a VAS score or repeated vital signs. The CRF data should be consistent with the source documents and any discrepancies should be explained. 
You should have a written agreement with the sponsor via the monitor what data, if any, can be directly recorded into the case report form. And it should be called a source document memo. This document should be signed off by the principal investigator and the monitor and a copy kept in the site file for reference so that it can be um, analysed throughout the, the study lifetime to make sure that it doesn't need adjusting. So a quick slide on document control. All documents should have version numbers and dates. There should be a standard numbering system. It actually helps because when you look at your um, review board um, authorizations, you will be able to see which document they actually approved for use and you can cross check that with your file. So you make sure that the dates and the version numbers are consistent with what has been approved. And one thing that I do not like in my institution is when I'm making the initial REC submission, despite the fact that the protocol, for example, may have um, come into my inbox through several iterations, I will not be submitting version 15 to the FX committee, for example. It will be ver final version 1. So just make sure that you keep your format consistent so that if it's draft, it's got the word draft so that throughout the iterations you know exactly what you're working on and you don't get the inspectors coming in, for example, opening up my file that may have a, the first um, version, 15, in there, wanting to know, well, where's the rest of the versions then? So it just stops all of those questions. That the approval and distribution procedures are also defined. So quality control. It's the operational techniques and activities that are undertaken within the quality assurance system to verify that the requirements for the quality of a trial related activities have been fulfilled. It's identifying a problem and implementing a solution. So this is where a really good monitor um, comes into their own. It is continuous during the research and it can be carried out by the people conducting the work. So if you're not assigned a monitor and you've got a a sponsor that provides you with faxed checklists, sort of just to flick through the file because they've decided that they're going to be doing um, remote monitoring. Get a team member just to sort of quickly run over things and make sure that your files are up to date. The sponsor should utilise appropriately qualified individuals to supervise the overall conduct of the trial, to handle the data and to verify the data to conduct the statistical analysis and to prepare the trial reports. So there are some revision two additions. The sponsor should implement um, a system to manage the quality throughout all stages of the trial process. The focus should be on activities essential for participation, protection and reliability of the trial results, which includes the design, the procedures and the information collected. The quality system needs to be proportionate to the risks. This is the major addition to GCP. The methods used to assure and control the quality of the trial should be proportionate to the risks inherent in that study and the importance of the information collected. The sponsors should ensure that all aspects of the trial are operationally feasible and should avoid unnecessary complexity, procedures and data collection. Protocols, case report forms and other operational documents should be clear, concise and consistent. So if I'm helping and assisting an investigator with a submission to the competent authorities or to the review board, I pull in the application form, the information sheet, the protocol, the consent form, the safety information, and I cross-check every single document to make sure that I'm not missing something because I don't want the competent authority or the review board to point anything out that I've missed. So that's one of the main things that I will do, is I will just make sure that they are all consistent. The statistician should also have a say on the data collected for the analysis, which in turn needs to be agreed both with the sponsor and the CI. So the quality management system should, be, should use a risk-based approach based on these. 
So a good example I thought of would be bloods. So if you're um, collecting bloods which need to be sent off um, to a central lab and you look at your central lab's opening hours and they tell you that they can't accept samples after midday on a Friday, but you've got a clinic Friday morning, then you've got the choice of either making sure that those bloods theoretically will not be um, spoiled and that they can be stored safely without interfering with the analysis somewhere over the weekend so you can send them when the um, labs open because if they do get sent off then where are they going to sit because the lab's closed Um, or picking another lab that is actually open. So by um, communication, risk communication, you would be telling all of your sites that they would need to be stored over the weekend or that you do not pick up patients in that clinic for taking the bloods and that you would tell them that no bloods will be sent off to that um, laboratory. And you would keep reviewing that to make sure that the communication that you've actually provided works and report any risks and um, escalate if required. So monitoring... Its purpose is to verify that the rights, well-beings of the subjects are protected, which is what the line is all the way through GCP, that the data is accurate, complete and verifiable from the source documents, so they will pick the patient notes or medical records that they want you to provide them when they go to their visit, that the conduct of a trial is in compliance with the approved protocol, amendments, GCP and the applicable regulatory requirements. The monitors should be appointed by the sponsor. They should be appropriately trained and qualified scientifically and or clinically. They should be familiar with the protocol, the drug, the patient information, obviously the sponsor SOPs and good clinical practice and any of the applicable um, regulations. So there are some R2 additions, revision to additions. The sponsor should develop a systematic, prioritised, risk-based approach to monitoring the clinical trials. The flexibility in the extent and nature of monitoring described in this section is intended to permit varied approaches that improve the effectiveness and efficiency of the monitoring. The sponsor may choose on-site monitoring, a combination of on-site and centralised monitoring, or where justified, just centralised monitoring. So that's where you get the the checklist just being faxed through to you and you're expected to do it yourself at site. I used to hate that. They always used to sit in the bottom of my tray because I couldn't prioritise a piece of paper that I was supposed to take the place of a monitor. So I personally, I'm not a fan of that at all. The sponsor should document, document the rationale for the chosen monitoring strategy in the monitoring plan. Again, the monitoring plan is now defined in Chapter 1, so you've got a definition of what that document should be and what it represents. On-site monitoring is performed at sites at which the clinical trial has been conducted. Centralised monitoring is a remote evaluation of accumulating data performed in a timely manner, supported by appropriately qualified and trained persons, e.g. data managers and biostatisticians. The centralised monitoring processes provide additional monitoring capabilities that can complement and reduce the extent and or frequency of on-site monitoring and help distinguish between reliable data and potentially unreliable data. Review that may include statistical analysis of accumulating data from centralised monitoring can be used to identify inconsistent data or data outliers, unexpected lack of variability and protocol deviations. It can examine data trends, such as the range, consistency and variability of data within and across sites. It can evaluate for the systematic or significant errors in data collection and reporting at a site or across sites or potential data manipulation or data integrity problems, which would then trigger an on-site visit. You'd analyse the site characteristics and performance metrics And you can select sites and or processes for targeted on-site monitoring.
On-site and or centralised monitoring should be provided to the sponsor, including appropriate management and staff responsible for the trial on site oversight in a timely manner for the review and follow-up. Results of monitoring activities should be documented in a sufficient detail to allow verification of compliance within the monitoring plan. Reporting of centralised monitoring activities should be regular and may be independent from site visits. The sponsor should always develop a monitoring plan that is tailored to the specific human subject protection and data integrity risks of the trial. The plan should describe the monitoring strategy, the monitoring responsibilities of all the parties involved, the various monitoring methods to be used and the rationale for their use. The plan should also emphasise the monitoring of critical data and processes. Particular attention should be given to those aspects that are not routine clinical practice and that require additional training. The monitoring plan should reference the applicable policies and procedures. Electronic data, R2 additions. The sponsors should base their approach to validation of such systems on risk assessment that takes into consideration the intended use of the system and the potential of the system to affect human subject protection and the reliability of the trial results. They should maintain SOPs for using these systems. The SOP should cover system setup, installation and use. The SOP should describe system validation and functionality. Data collection and handling, system maintenance, system security measures, change control, data backup, recovery, contingency planning and decommissioning. The responsibilities of a sponsor, investigator and other parties with respect to the use of these computerised systems should be clear. And it is something that the inspectors now with these R2 changes are really concentrating on. And the users should be provided with training in their use. So the biggest no-no that I can pass on to you is not to share passwords for electronic systems because if the audit trail shows that you've accessed a system on several occasions and you'd actually passed or shared that with a colleague, you need to be able to answer to anything that went wrong um, with the entries. So I would suggest wherever possible, get your own password. Right, amendments. You've got substantial amendments and non-substantial amendments. So substantial is an amendment to the protocol or any of the other supporting documents that is likely to affect to a significant degree the safety or physical or mental integrity of the trial subjects, the scientific value of a trial, the conduct or the management of a trial. Now substantial amendments would normally require review and approval from the Institutional Review Board and or, where relevant, the competent authority, and they must have approved those before they can be implemented unless it's an urgent safety measure, but I'll cover that quickly later. Also, I need to say um, at this stage that you would need to make sure that your training log is updated. So just remember, if you've put in an amendment and it's changed something, Make sure that all of your team members are aware of what's been changed and document it in your training log. The inspectors will love it. For non-substantial um, amendments, it normally only requires notification to um, the competent authority or the review board and can include things like typos, amending members of their research team except CIs and PIs because obviously they are significant to the management of their trial subjects. You must retain all of, the sub all of the documents in the files. Any documents that are no longer approved for use must be clearly marked as superseded and as I said before, date when you've taken them out of circulation. The worst thing that I can find when I go into a, a site to look at a file is a pile of documents with lines through them. Great. So when did the person stop using them? You must include pharmacy in the circulation list of approved protocols and any updated reference safety information. So urgent safety measures. 
There must be arrangements for taking appropriate urgent safety measures to protect the participants against any immediate hazard where new events relating to the conduct of a trial or development of the drug are likely to affect the safety of the subjects. In many studies, the individual best able to take these measures will be the chief investigator or another identified person or organisation rather than the sponsor directly. The protocol should identify the specific individual or individuals who accept this responsibility. Otherwise, the sponsor does remain ultimately responsible. These safety measures, such as temporarily halting the study, may be taken without prior authorisation from the competent authority, but must be subsequently reported to that authority and the ethics committee. So just to summarise, you would need to immediately get in contact with your competent authority and have a discussion as to the events that led up to that event. And you need to agree with that competent authority the next steps and how best to manage both that particular participant and any other participants that are on your study. Now the three days would be you would have to summarise that conversation and agreement with the competent authority and then send that to them within the three days. And then they can expect an amendment. So within that time, following you letting them know by summarising the agreement, you would then need to cascade that down to all of your staff members and any of the other sites as to what's happened and what you are now implementing. It then gives you enough time to prepare and submit an amendment. So there was a case when I was working at the Royal Marsden in um, London where we were looking at capsitabine at the time. There was an awful lot of investigator-initiated studies using capsitabine, obviously very generously supported by, um, I think it's Roche. couldn't swear to it. Um, but we decided that we was going to be putting the capsitabine with, I believe it was epirubicin, at the normal standard dose. Now, there was a patient that um, became very quite seriously ill because the capsitabine and epirubicin, the epirubicin actually potentiated um, the capsitabine dose, and we ended up having to go down a dose level but we ended up implementing an urgent safety measure, reducing down to the next dose level to all of the patients that were in that study, and that's how we rolled forward. And that, I believe, because I think it was um, reduced down to 850 milligrams per metre squared dose, but the original dose was something like 1250 milligrams per metre dose, so it did have to drop quite significantly. So there are some inspection findings, as always. So lack of essential documents. Remember that huge pile of paperwork? So people aren't keeping all of the documents that they're supposed to. For example, um, drug shipment records, which your pharmacy department's supposed to keep. Blood sample shipments to central labs. Now we've got um, template logs um, on, available on the St George's website if anybody wants to dip in there and have a look. So we've got logs for everything, telephone logs, GP letter logs, um, sample logs, so that we can actually keep track of what samples we're keeping, where we're keeping them, when they get sent off, and when they get destroyed. Incomplete trial um, subject screening list. So this, your statistician might actually get a little bit upset about that, um, because they can't see um, to complete the information in their consult diagram. So how many patients you've actually tried screening. Um, missing source documents. Discrepancies between the source data and the data reported in the clinical study report. Lack of evidence of sponsor procedure use. Poor document control. Documents not superseded or removed from circulation upon update. And dare I say, illegible source data. But as I got a pharmacy background, I could become quite, um, quite inept at reading doctor's writing because of the prescriptions. So 
You guys aren't great sometimes. Right, principle 12. Investigational products should be manufactured, handled and stored in accordance with the applicable good manufacturing practice. A drug should be used in accordance with the approved protocol. So this is where you'd use your pharmacy experts to assist. So all drugs, including the comparators and the placebo, must be manufactured in accordance with any of the applicable good manufacturing practice, and it should be coded and labelled in a matter, manner that protects the blinding and in accordance with the applicable regulatory requirements. Decoding and unblinding of treatment in case of medical emergency only. So 95% of the time it will be your pharmacy department that will have access um, to the documentation that would allow for your patient to be unblinded. The storage temperatures, storage conditions... Um, with regards to protection from light, any reconstitution fluids and procedures, and stability and compatibility information can also be provided by your pharmacy department. So the drug accountability and the chain of custody details, so from the very first shipment delivery to the dispensing um, to any of your patients, the participant returns and the compliance checks, and then the reconciliation at the site and when they get sent off back to the sponsor and or they are destroyed. It is the sponsor's responsibility to ensure that this information is available. So for for academic or investigator-led studies, pharmacy departments should have access and have input into the competent authority clinical trials application. And the drug management and description section in the protocol, which would include the labelling, the storage and the selection of the drug uh, manufacturer and or supplier. The other things that pharmacy can and should assist with are the access and choice of support of rescue medications, code breaking and the adequate blinding of the product. Pharmacy could also be the only unblinded team members within the study management. So I'm not going to go through um, the quite extensive list of documents that are required in the pharmacy site file. Now when you come to archiving, you will be putting the pharmacy site file and the investigator site file together. So these documents will end up in the ISF. Principle 13, it's the last of the principles you'll be pleased to know. Systems with procedures that assure that the quality of every aspect of the trial should be implemented. So together with all of the other systems and considerations in place, there are still more ways to assure the continued quality of your product, project, the data and the safety of your patients. This is, as alluded to earlier, where a good study monitor is worth their weight in gold. Regular trial management group meetings should be held to discuss day-to-day aspects of the project and you may also require data and safety monitoring committees that would receive regular reports and oversee significant events within the study lifetime and advise the sponsor on risk mitigation or, for example, the next dose level increment for a dose escalation study. So... The sponsor is an individual company, institution or organisation which takes on the responsibility for the initiation, management and or financing of a clinical trial. Now we all know if we've come from the academic world that the academic sponsors are not the ones that finance the studies. We will go out to the charities or to award bodies to actually ask whether or not they will finance our study. Now they're not in a position to take on the sponsorship So it's a partnership made in heaven. All clinical trials must have a designated sponsor and they should be named on the protocol. As I'm saying there, it's not necessarily the funder and it is typically the chief investigator employer. And the sponsor can delegate responsibilities to the investigators. So there are some R2 um, additions to the sponsor responsibilities. 
that the sponsor should ensure oversight of any trial-related duties and functions carried out on its behalf, which includes the trial-related duties and functions that are subcontracted to another party by the sponsor's contracted CROs. So no longer can the sponsor, an academic sponsor, for example, just say, no, I'm going to give that all to the CTU, the clinical trials units. They need to have oversight of all of their processes, and they are ultimately responsible. If there is a non-compliance that significantly affects or potentially affects human subjects, protection or reliability of the trial results is discovered, the sponsor should perform a root cause analysis and implement appropriate corrective and preventative actions. We're nearly done. Compliance with GCP provides the public assurance that the rights, safety and well-being of trial subjects are protected, consistent with the principles that have their origin in the Declaration of Helsinki, and that the clinical trial data is credible. To do a quick whiz through some safety reporting. So pharmacovigilance is the process and science of monitoring the safety of the medicines and taking action to reduce the risks and increase the benefits of those medicines. So what's it all about? So you collect and manage the data on the safety of the medicines. We would interrogate that data to detect any signals which would um, highlight any new or changing issues. It forms the basis of the evaluation and decision-making with regards to safety issues. It is proactive risk management to minimise potential risk associated with the medicine's use. We are acting to protect public health and including regulatory action. And we are um, in charge of communication with and informing the stakeholders and the public about what we've discovered. So you must include the process within your protocol and abide by your sponsor's SOPs. So we're going to run through some definitions. I'm not going to read these out to you. Happy? Serious adverse events is any adverse event that at any dose results in death, is life-threatening, requires hospitalisation or prolongation of existing inpatients hospitalisation, results in persistent or significant disability or incapacity, is a congenital anomaly or birth defect, or is otherwise considered medically significant by the investigator. So what is medically significant? It could be pregnancy or impregnation. If that's the case, then you'd need to follow up um, that particular lady and her pregnancy up till birth. And depending on the nature of the drug, you may have to um, keep going and follow that child for its development. It would have to be stipulated in the protocol. Something else which is medically significant, the lack of efficacy It may be a significant hazard to the subject population if a drug used intended to treat a life-threatening disease didn't work. What about overdose, abuse or misuse? The protocol should also include guidance here. And this, again, is something that the pharmacy department may help you with. So they would need to make sure that if there is a protocol in place, protocol, a procedure in place, that if the patient turned up in casualty and they'd had an overdose of the drug that you are looking at, if there is something that that patient would be required to have, that it's actually in stock, it's available and everybody knows how to use it. But also at that stage um, suggest that we normally give our patients cards So they're normally the size of um, credit cards, which tells everyone that they're involved in a clinical trial, 
gives them the trial identification so that it can be easily found on a database who the chief investigator is and who to contact in, um, in case of emergency, just in case you get that sort of problem. Is it an expected serious adverse event, but an unexpected outcome? An increase in frequency or severity of a serious adverse event, which is another reason why, if you're keeping your adverse event log up to date, that your chief investigator or the principal investigator at the site should be regularly reviewing those logs and signing when they've done it, because then it's evidence that he's reviewed it, just to check for signals, um, trends. So the pregnancy follow-up may differ depending on the drug pharmacodynamic profile, hence the scientific advice may need to be sought, or just because of the long-term possible effects may not be known at all, just to follow up. Lack of efficacy may well have been picked up by the unblinded statistician reviewing the emerging data for the presentation at the Data um, Safety Committee. So serious adverse reactions, your SARS. So it's any adverse reaction that is classed as serious and is consistent with the reference safety information. So i.e. it is expected, it's already known about. So pharmacy may have a vital role in advising on management or in provision of the medication required for an onward patient management in the case that somebody did have an adverse reaction so that they've got antihistamines available, for example. SUSARS. Any adverse reaction that is classed as serious and is suspected to have been caused by the drug and is not consistent with the reference safety information. So whenever we get a report in for a serious um, adverse event or a serious adverse reaction, we always look at the reference safety information to see whether or not it's been reported before. If it has, then we don't have to worry about reporting it any further. If it hasn't, it then gets classed as a SUSAR, which is your unexpected. So when you're planning your protocol, you do need to think ahead. You need to list what you would expect to find your um, participants suffering with, be it disease-related or drug-related, so that you keep some of your reporting down the volume, especially if you think about your um, area of study, cardiovascular studies. There are particular signs and symptoms that you would expect because of the patient population? Do you really want to record all of those, which you should really if you don't define them in your protocol? You should define your reporting period. So following the drug dose, how many days following that drug do you want to carry on waiting sort of like for reports to come in? Now I think it's normally six times the half-life of a drug that is suggested. So that needs to be um, referenced in your protocol and defined. You need to state which expected serious adverse re um, reactions will not be recorded or that do not require immediate reporting, but do state when and how they will be reported, whether or not it's going to be in the outcome um, data or within X amount of days of the event. You need to reference the procedures to be followed in the event of a serious adverse event and clearly state who you expect to follow those procedures. So how? Maintaining lists of um, adverse events and reactions that occur during the study, they do not need to be reported but may require notification to the sponsor in accordance with the monitoring plan and protocol. So check your monitoring plan. All adverse event logs should be regularly clinically reviewed by the CI to rule out trends increase in frequency or severity, and you need to document those reviews in the TMF. And if, as a PI, you have looked at that and you do feel that collectively you are seeing a trend increase in severity or frequency, then that collectively should be escalated to the sponsor.
So this is how we would assess causality. This is the table that we would use when you're thinking about what's happened in relation to the drug and its dosing. So definitely, probably or possibly would require expedited reporting to the competent authority. Right, next exercise. How are we doing for time? Time. Okay. Right, we'll run through these together then, yeah? Thank you very much. So what do you think of the first one? So you, have you got your sheet? So what was it? No, they haven't had any drug, but it is an adverse event, unfortunately. Right, so what about number two? What do you think? If you, this is actually a SAR, a SUSAR. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's obviously beneficial, but it was still unexpected. And to the company's delight, they then manufactured and marketed that particular drug for um, helping people to stop smoking. And the other um, one that I can think of that was marketed, I think it was for blood pressure, minoxidil. And one of the side effects was malpattern hair. 
started to grow, so then the company leapt upon that and made lots of money. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad effect, but all effects need to be recorded. What about um, number three? So I think this one's a bit of a tricky one, number three. I suppose there's a couple of ways of looking at it. I mean, it's an adverse incident. It could mean that you would um, report that within your institutional um, hospital with regards to the patient taking the overdose. You would need to check the labelling and the instructions to make sure that the patient was actually instructed to take the medication properly. And also, if it was no effect, did the drug actually work? I mean, would the pharma company be interested to know that Major Tom had actually taken far too many tablets and nothing happened? (coughs) So some pharma companies would actually want you to tell them, report it, and tell them sort of like what happened to the patient, possibly for that reason. What about number four? Yep, for sure, for sure. And that's an unfortunate um, example of something that actually did happen. Um, Number five. So this is going to fall under your medically significant SAE. Number six. Yeah, so it's an adverse reaction, adverse event. Nothing's too major. Number seven. What is it? So I'd have that down as an SAE. Hmm. Yep. Yeah. And what do you think with regards to assigning causality in relation to the dose? So the event in relation to the dose. Hmm. Yeah. Is that something else that you have to bear in mind? So what about number eight? Yeah, it's just unfortunate, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Excellent. Right, we're on the home straight, people. So, common inspection findings. Failure to report the SUSARs. Failure to follow up pregnancy outcomes. Subject confidentiality, so they're actually leaving identifiable information on the SAE forms. Failure to submit annual safety reports and developmental safety update reports in a timely fashion. Inadequate instructional procedure obtained in the protocols to ensure that adverse events are recorded or reported appropriately. And the lack of sponsor oversight on the process to ensure and to monitor the compliance of the submissions. So a developmental safety update report, it replaces the annual safety reports and it's normally submitted on the anniversary of the first international birth date 
of the competent authority approval. Paediatric studies may require six monthly reports, but when you get your competent authority um, approval, they would normally stipulate if they want you to report more frequently than annually. If you're listing multiple studies, then you include each study until the declaration of the end of that study. The DSA, and that actually, going back to that um, multiple studies, something which I wasn't very clear about until very recently when I really um, looked at the guidance. If you have your last patient last visit within a, dis a DSA reporting period, if it falls before the anniversary, you still have to submit a DSA going up to that last patient last visit. So I just thought I'd add that because I just discovered it and, yeah. Um, aggregate reporting, ensure that all of the SAEs and SUSARs for that reporting period are line listed and that they're tabulated in the suggested format and there is a template for these reports to go in. You check for any new information or publications that have occurred during that reporting period and any updates on the reference safety information if you're using licensed medication. Whilst you're doing this, you are actually re-evaluating the risk. So in this review of the reference safety information and your publications, or not your publications, but anything else that's been going on in the clinical trial world, with that particular medication, you'll need to put on that information and decide, does that change any information that you are providing your fully informed subjects? Because if it does, that that may result in patient information sheet updates. So there are more reports, unfortunately. So you've got your annual progress reports, which are due to your review board. So they want to know how many patients um, that you've actually subjected to your um, protocol, to your research. If you haven't or you've had problems because you're not recruiting to your time and target what, what um, barriers have been in place, any amendments that have been put in place during that reporting period, it needs to be um, submitted within 30 days of the anniversary of the REC approval and you keep going until the end of trial. You have to make the declaration of end of study to your review board so that they know that they can close your file. There is an appropriate form and you need to do that within 90 days of the end of study or within 15 days if the study is terminated early. And if you're terminating a study early, you would normally um, put in an amendment too. So the final report on the research has to go into the review board, and that's normally within 12 months. So it is the end of the study. However, we now have to archive. So who does it? It is the responsibility of the sponsor and the chief investigator. It is all of the essential documents that are in the trial master file and your site files. It should be following the end of the study report. So once you get your study report, that should be your final piece of paper that actually um, goes into your files. There should be an archiving SOP um, held by the sponsor and there should be a named archivist that looks after the records. It should be stored in a secure environmentally controlled area. So in the UK, we actually use um, Iron Mountain. And from pictures that I've seen, it is literally, I need to go and physically visit one, but it's, it's just a warehouse full of rows and rows of grills so that you can't actually get any creatures crawling underneath or eating the study records. It's humidity um, controlled. There are no sprinklers. It's very, very tightly controlled so you know that it's safe. So it should be retained for a minimum of five years for non-drug studies and 15 years after study end for drug studies. So quickly, so that I can tell you that you've had a little bit of directives and regulations. So here's um, a bit of 
banding about what happened when. So you had the GMP, the Good Manufacturing Practice Directive, which was brought into play on the 8th of October 2003. You had the Clinical Trials Directive on the 1st of May 2004. Then the GCP Directive on the 8th of April 2005. And then finally, we've got the European Clinical Trials Regulation, which was supposed to um, be put into place in May of last year, but we keep having the, the barriers push forward. And if they're going to be adopting, or we are going to be adopting the Data Protection Regulation, I do suspect that we're going to be adopting that one as well around about the same time. So I'm looking at about May 2018. So I'm just going to have a quick look at the history of the European Directive. So its goal was to simplify and standardise the clinical trial applications for both commercial and academic sponsors across Europe. Obviously, to protect the safety and well-being of participants and improve the quality of emerging data. However, it increased the documentation burden for our academic partners it also increased with that the financial burden for the academics and their host institutions acting as sponsors because they're simply not staffed in the same way as the big commercial companies were. It was supposed to one size fits all and it clearly did not. So it, it meant that the, the academic study of looking at warfarin versus aspirin, for example, now had to go for a full commercial type application to the competent authority. So... We did see um, quite a dip in activity. The academic research is involved in the study of well-established drugs, such as the example I've just given, used commonly in daily practice, have to adhere to the same stringent regulations as large pharma investigating novel therapies. The major areas of change is that now the ethics um, review boards were regulated, that each member state had to appoint a competent authority, that it strengthened the consent for the vulnerable groups and it was a firm process for amendments. And it all resulted, both in positive, or all results, both positive and negative, should be made available. The GCP directive since has made amendments such as duty to, duties to be delegated but not responsibilities and that the notifications on serious breaches were also given strict timelines and report routes. The European Forum for GCP compared data between 2003 and 2007. Commercial studies submitted and conducted increased by 11% and 30% respectively. Academic studies submitted remained unchanged, but studies conducted decreased by 25%. For the Euro European Organisation for Research and Treatment of Cancer, new trials fell by 63% between 2004 and 2005. Academic clinical trials fell by 75% in Finland, 70% in Ireland, 25% in Sweden and 66% in Austria. So why? So each member state interpretation still led to the need for country-specific document requirements thus increasing the administrative burden for multinational studies, so Europe became increasingly less attractive. So then came the regulation. So we're all aware that a directive, once that's passed, each member state then has to pull that directive and make its own interpretation and then publish it in its own national laws. With a regulation that removes any interpretation, it is, it says what it is on the tin. So there's some highlights, and there's only about four or five slides left. It will not apply to non-interventional studies. So we do have some um, interpretations or um, clinical study is an investigation in relation to humans intended to discover or verify the clinical, pharmacological or other 
pharmacodynamic effects of one or more medicinal products, to identify any adverse reactions to one or more medicinal products, or to study the pharmacokinetics or the pharmacodynamics with the objective of ascertaining safety and efficacy of those drugs. So what is covered by this regulation? Clinical trials are covered. It's the assignment of a subject to a particular therapeutic strategy decided in advance and does not fall within the normal clinical practice in the member state concerned. In a non-interventional study, just so that you get the balance, the patient is usually treated within normal practice. Or, next, the decision to prescribe the drug is taken together with the decision to include the subject in the clinical study. Again, in a non-interventional study, the decision to prescribe a treatment is, to, is taken before entry into that study. So the last, diagnostic or monitoring procedures, in addition to normal clinical practice, are applied to the subjects. So this would be interventional, and so this is a clinical trial. So they are further um, divvied up. We've got the low interventional trial. So for drugs which exclude placebos, which are authorised accordance to the protocol of the clinical trial. The drugs are used in accordance with the terms of the marketing authorisation. The use of the drugs is evidence-based and published by scientific evidence on safety and efficacy of those drugs in any member state concerned. And the additional diagnostic or monitoring procedures do not pose more than minimal additional risk or burden to the safety of subjects compared to normal practice in any member state. So in the UK, the competent authority, the MHRA, are already using this risk-adaptive approach. So just to demonstrate what that actually means, so we have type A, which is um, routine prescribing. So that would have been your warfarin versus aspirin because they're well-established drugs. They were being prescribed and used in the normal um, population which they were intended. So that now, um, these years on, would have been classed as a type A so because of the type A, what the MHRA did is they defined what would be expected or what could be left out of their um, clinical trials application pack. So we no longer had to add on Annex 13 clinical trial labelling. We no longer had to keep um, dispensing um, logs in the pharmacy, sort of like take them off of the ward um, shelf and then bring them down to pharmacy for them to be labelled with all the temperature logs and the accountability um, just to give them to the patients that would normally have got them anyway. So that's been removed. It also reduces archive and record retention times. So again, that reduces the cost. So type B um, is a somewhat higher than that of standard of care. And in this, the MHRA will allow you to say, no, I don't, I don't think that this particular drug requires Annex 13 labelling, and they will consider um, cases put before them. Um, next. So what is going to happen with the regulation? It's going to be a single electronic application, which will be submitted via the European portal, and that's what the delay is. It's the setup of that portal and the activation. It's going to be a two-part application, so I can't imagine that the contents of the application are going to be much different to what you do now. So you're going to have the scientific part, which would normally have gone to the competent authority. That's not changed. And then you've got the country-specific part, which would normally have gone to your institutional review board. So that will go via the European portal. Now, what is going to change is the amount of notifications that you have to provide throughout the running of your study. So the sponsor, who may then delegate this down to the chief investigator, is required to notify via the portal within 15 days of um, any of these activities. So it's from the start of recruitment. So as soon as you've been given green light to go, they want to know. Your first patient in with their first visit 
the end of recruitment, last patient, last visit, the final end of trial, so if it's an international or multinational study rather, it's going to be your last patient, last country visit, any suspensions, temporary halts, terminations, SUSARs, annual safety reports and third country inspection reports. So there is going to be clarification on the use of data obtained based on informed consent. So this is where I think it's going to tie in very nicely with the um, data protection regulation following withdrawal of consent. That all previous trial data and the submission must be registered on a database. And they've given the example of the UDRA um, CT or the clinicaltrials.gov. Public access to the European Clinical Trial Database. So the results must be available in lay summary. Participants must be told how to find those results. Any serious breaches should be reported within seven calendar days. And urgent safety measures reported within seven days rather than the three days, which it was previously. And the trial master file should now be archived for 25 years minimum. So that's going to significantly push up cost. So as I um, said, timetable is dependent on the European submission portal setup. It was planned for the mid-2017 after being pushed from um, mid-2016, so we do have to await the announcement. There will be, as there normally is, a transition period to allow that anything submitted before the effective date to continue under the existing directive for three years. The end. <laughs>